marketing expert, I'm just a person who's been relatively successful in doing what I do, which is doing crazy weird hippie stuff. Uh, I do something called embodiment, you can define that for you later if you like. Um, I've been teaching that in business for the last 10 years, so I've worked in really mainstream business environments, public sector, private sector, I've worked with humanitarian aid workers all around the world in, in war zones, which are actually some very difficult markets to get into, actually, believe it or not. And um, I work with yoga teachers around something called embodied yoga principles. So the main thing there is teaching psychology to yoga teachers. So I'm not actually, I mean, I'm, I've done yoga for 20 years, but I'm not uh, a yoga teacher primarily myself. But I work a lot with yoga teachers, so like Vidi Nasa and Jude and some people you've, you've met already. And what started happening a few years ago is my hippie mates would like grab me after like fire rhythms or yoga or Aikido or whatever, and they'd say, hey, can you help me with my business? And I'd say, well, I'm not really, that's not really my thing, but I'll happily help you out. And I'd sit and have a coffee with them, and over a short period of time, they would say, wow, you really helped me to uh, move forward with my marketing, with, with what I'm doing. Um, and eventually I thought, well, there's something in this, you know, I feel like even just knowing a little bit about this subject could really help a lot of people. Um, so eventually we did some like, online courses on this, videos, and, and I frequently noticed, like I do a lot of courses on employment for coaches or yoga teachers, and we always do a bit of marketing at the end. Um, why would I do that? You know, because it's sort of the missing piece for me. I'd go on a course, and um, on that course, I'd learn a skill. So for you guys, the skill is learning to work with people in cancer or in that environment with yoga, or you know, be like I don't know, teaching embodiment yoga teachers or whatever. But then after there would be nothing about how to actually get into the world. Does that make sense? So actually, I sort of thought well, that's pretty useless because I can know all the best things on the planet, but if I can't actually get it to anyone, what's the point? Does that make sense? So I started doing bits on the end of all my courses about marketing and sales, and some of it's like what we call the outer game, which is basically we're gonna, we're gonna look at like knowing about benefits, and knowing about channels, and USPs, and things like that, great business -y. and the other side's more like the inner game. So that's, okay, for example, if you have guilt about selling something, or if you have trouble as a person being seen, yeah, that is going to undermine all your marketing. Even if you read lots of books on marketing, look at all the web pages, if you've still got an inner issue. Or, I mean, even when I say the word marketing, notice what happens in your body, yeah? Or if I say the word sales or money, some of you stop breathing. Some, you know, I said at the lunch table, I could see some of you sort of visibly recoil away from me when I said the word marketing or money or sales or business or any of these words. So you might just feel like, you know, we'll come to that inner side of that in a minute. So there is this very deep psychological side, which is kind of a shadow of more alternative, uh, we might say alternative industries, alternative areas like yoga, life coaching, the same when I work with dance teachers, all people from sort of alternative backgrounds, yeah. Um, Okay, so the first thing we need to do is frame marketing in a way which might be more attractive and healthy for you, uh, but yet it's realistic. Um, so it's really, really simple. Um, getting stuff to people they, that need it, that's marketing. Okay? So um, if you're thirsty and I have a bottle of water, at the moment we have a problem, don't we? Because you're thirsty and I have a bottle of water and it's in the wrong place. So at some point I need to let you know I've got a bottle of water and let you know if it's not immediately obvious, this can be the lead. So it's not vodka, it's actually water. Does that make sense? Yeah, so that's what marketing is. Um, I even go so far, and this has been a bit radical, saying marketing is love. Marketing is love. So why do I say that? Well, if you are able to help people and meet their needs, why the hell would you not fucking tell them that? Does that make sense? Yeah, like if you believe, by the way, I swear, I hope it doesn't offend you, there's worse things in the world, I would. Um, so I would say marketing is love because it's like it's about self-love, it's about believing what you're doing and knowing what you do has real value, and then it's getting about getting it effectively to people that need it. Yeah, so that's that's all we're talking about here. Okay, it's all we're talking about. So what we're not trying to do is confront the problems of global capitalism or <laughs> the evils of consumer culture, which I, I'll, I'll happily have that conversation with you. You know, I've, I've been I've worked with some of the poorest people in the world, some of the richest people in the world and, you know, literally, of course, the richest in the world. And, um, you know, first of all, there's good people in both camps, <laughs> and there's shitty people in both camps as well, and lots of people in the middle. Um, so that's the first thing I'd say. Uh, the next thing I'd say is, yeah, I totally see problems with the way wealth is distributed in the world. I definitely see problems with consumer culture. If I walk down the street in Brighton, I see, like, advertising, and it's, like, telling me I should have a six-pack or whatever. 
And you know, I look at that and go, I'm not really happy about aspects of consumer culture. So like, I'm with you on the big picture if you're, if you're kind of similarly aligned, as I imagine you are if you're friends with Jude. Um, but then there's also the specifics about, okay, I've got a body yoga teacher training in a month, how do I fill that up? Yeah? A, because it benefits the people that will come, because it's a useful thing for them to learn. B, and no shame in this, it benefits me. And if I can't pay my rent, of which in Brighton is quite expensive, I can't continue to do what I'm doing. So it's actually, if you don't know marketing, that's a form of self-abuse. Yeah? So not paying attention to marketing, I would say, is a form of violence, both to yourself and to others. Okay, so I'm going to totally flip this for you, and, and tell me if my logic is wrong. Say that again. So if you're not uh, paying attention to marketing, and learning how to some skill in it, if you're an expert, I would say that's A, a form of self-abuse, because if you can't pay your own rent, you're on the street, right? You can't live the life you want, and B, you're keeping what your gifts and the things you're good at from people that need it. And I would say that is almost violence, right? If I had some water and you lot were, had no water and you really needed a drink and I was like hiding it away, well, a bit of dick, wouldn't I? Yeah? So um, that's how I want to frame it to begin with. If that's all we're doing is meeting our own needs, meeting other people's needs. Um, I would say we can talk about Jedi versus Sith marketing. So if you don't know what Star Wars is, First of all, where have you been for the last 30 years? But anyway, the Jedi are like the good guys in Star Wars. And for me, that's what I'm talking about in terms of marketing. The Sith, we can think of as the bad guys. And a lot of marketing comes from the point of view of trying to take from people, lying, manipulating, uh, like fear-driven marketing. Like buy this, or else you know you're kind of, you'll, your children will get ill unless you put bleach on everything or whatever the fear they're trying to convey is, you know. Um, so I'm not coming from that point of view of sort of fear driven or you know lies or lack of integrity. That's sort of one way to do marketing and it can work to a degree. The good news is in the modern world it actually works less and less. Yeah. The good news is in the modern world because there's lots of peer reviews on everything because people are getting quite savvy. People are almost immune to advertising now. The, like what I call ethical or I call it Jedi, Jedi marketing is actually um, becoming more and more effective and more and more necessary. Cool, does that kind of set the stage for where we're at so far, yeah? So um, a good thing to learn, a way to be kind to yourself and to other people, a way to put something positive into the world in an integrous way, that's what I'm interested in helping people with, yeah? Okay, so what are some of the basics of that? Um, in a way, this is like marketing 101, this is what you might learn at a local college or at a local business school. Um, there's lots of ways we can handle this. Let's, let's start with offer. Let's start with offer. So, um, with water, it's very obvious, isn't it? It's like the offer is your first thing, and now you won't be first thing, you won't die because you'll have some water. Yeah? What is the offer, however, of what you do? Um, so, for example, there's, there's an example I know of someone, uh, let's see. Oh, I know, it's a bit of this. So Billy Dasa, a friend of ours who was in yoga earlier, his yoga class, the offer is you become, you're more relaxed at the end of it than when you come in. For a lot of stressed people, that's a very nice thing, all right? But the real offer is might be health, that you're actually healthier because you're more relaxed. The real offer is you don't shout at your kids and feel guilty about that. The real offer is you don't get divorced because you're a complete stress head and my friends are paying you. Yeah? So we've got to look past the immediate offer to like what's the actual benefits to the thing, to the people that are coming. So this is like one of the big takeaways of today. Um, the first big takeaway is marketing isn't evil. The second big takeaway is do some. All right? And the third big takeaway is what my students said. What I learned from you was to do some marketing. I was like, great, <laughs> that's a good start. Yeah? It's like, like anything, you do it, you get better at it as well. Um, the third one, the third one here is like, what are the benefits of what you're selling? So I'm, I'm known for being a bit blunt, you probably warned you. Um, nobody gives a shit about you and what you do. Okay, maybe your mum, some other state, so we'll exclude her. My mum, my mum would probably buy any product that I was selling and come on any course just because she's my mum. But otherwise, actually that comes to a point in my relationship, which we'll come to in a bit. Um, but basically, nobody cares. Right, so um, what do you do? Let's say you do, what's your Scottish yoga thing called, you? Celtic yoga? I don't care about Celtic yoga. Why should I care about Celtic yoga? Yeah, I don't even know what that is. I don't want to spend the time to find out what it is. It takes time and energy. 
Yeah. What is a benefit of Celtic Yoga Gym? If I was to come and do that, it helps you to align your practice with the seasons. Why would I want to do that? So she's still telling me if it's not bad, she's getting there. But why would I want to align my practice with the seasons? Uh, so that you can. Um, do practices which are more um, specific to, to what's going on in a particular season so that you're not fighting your natural energy levels. Right, and if I fight my natural energy levels, what happens? You get fatigued and you reach burnout and you collapse. Okay, so it's a way of not doing that. Yeah. <laughs> so did you hear how we got to the benefit? So first of all, it's the name, and then she started talking about like the methodology, which is like, you know, align you with the seasons, blah, blah, blah. And then I'm still like, your, your best friend is like the customer that says, so what, so what, so what? And eventually you go, because then you won't die, or because then you'll be happy, or because then you'll get laid more, or whatever the like concrete thing is, that's what you're really selling. Does that make sense? Yeah, but that's what you're selling. So if in terms of yoga for cancer, you know, like what are the concrete benefits of doing that? Um, now the first thing I noticed is quite an emotive thing to be selling, isn't it? So when we come to the inner game, there's going to be people watching this on YouTube and be like, oh my god, you're selling yoga for cancer. Yeah, and so does an oncologist in a hospital, right? Like they get paid, they get paid quite well actually, yeah? So does a physiotherapist, so does a the nurse, so does everyone that's working with you know people in unfortunate circumstances generally, like whether it's a... Uh, refugee camp or you know whether it's people with HIV like it doesn't mean you don't get paid just because you're doing something good for the world you have to to continue doing it it's not sustainable if you don't so it makes sense yeah um, so what are some of the benefits that yoga would bring to that so for example it might be around uh, helping people to self-regulate when they're scared so I've worked with people with terminal illness they're often very afraid right it's probably something you to be talking about um, so helping people self-regulate with fear. Now, modern medicine might not be so good at that unless you're going to have a tranquilizer all the time, right? It's probably not so good for your health. T learning a few techniques that can help you deal with anxiety might be really, really useful for someone in that situation, yeah? Um, maybe it's the benefit is actually to do with their relationships. It's about being able to calm down enough so they can actually maintain intimate connection with their support network, for example, yeah? So um, this is one of the things I'd like you to think about, is like, what are the key benefits of what you're doing? Um, the thing that goes next to benefits is like, who's it for? So who's your market? And you might say people with cancer for this, right? But is, it, is it all people with cancer? Yeah. Is it everyone, every kind of cancer, every stage of cancer? Where do they live? How old are they? So for example, uh, in Embodied Yoga Principles, the people who are my market are mostly senior yoga teachers who are fairly open-minded, um, who aren't into like super body beautiful yoga and aren't super hippy dippy unicorn lovers. Yeah, so that might sound very, very vague to you, but I know who they are. I know who those people are, and I recognise them. I can, you know, I have an image in my head. It's someone a bit like Judy or someone a bit like Vanessa, and I actually have a sense of who that person is. So, um, who is your market? Yeah, often you'll be niching. Um, the power of the niche is a guy called Tad Hargrave, who has a website called Marketing for Hippies. He's a um, extremely cool Canadian, Tad Hargrave. Highly recommend him. Just got off the edge with that. And um, Tad is uh, well worth looking at. A lot of his stuff's on niching. So if you know who you're doing it with and what you're doing, the benefit that you're bringing, that's a niche. Does that make sense? So uh, I'll give you an example, I'll, I do some of the coaching around attraction sometimes and I was looking at this market and there's one coach in America who only helps Chinese American men of a certain age. That's what he does. So he helps because often there's prejudice against Chinese American men. It's like you've got some you know, or whatever, you know, there's certain prejudices that exist and that's the sole group of people he works with. Does that make sense? Yeah. I know an English teacher in Moscow, she only works, she teaches English to gay people. Now, that might not sound like a niche, but actually it is because she networked in that community. She happens to be a lesbian and that community is quite tight because it's pretty dangerous being gay in Moscow. Um, so they all know each other and a lot of them now are starting to go to like, international conferences and there's all these kind of reasons they want to learn English. And she knows everyone, so she's got trust and relationship. So I'm going to put this up as another big takeaway. So 
the key thing you're looking for in any we could call like sales funnel is actually a relationship funnel. Who's heard of a sales funnel? I don't know what a sales funnel is. So a sales funnel would be like um, I went to a party and I met all of you lot and then we chatted and then I said, look, this is what I do, body with yoga or whatever I was selling. And two of you said you were sort of a bit interested in it. And then eventually one of you comes to the course out of the eight of you. Does that make sense? Actually, what it's about is relationship and trust. So all sales and marketing is about increasing relationship and trust. This is why my mum would come to one of my courses no matter what it was called. Because she has a lot of trust and a lot of relationship. Jude would probably come to almost any of my courses based on what it was called if the price was right. Because she knows me quite well, we've known each other for a while, she's been to my courses before. If you're like a friend of Jude's and Jude recommended me to you, you'd probably at least have a good look at the thing that was in front of you. If you were a complete stranger, you'd be like, well, I'm busy, we're all busy, why should I bother looking at that one more type of yoga, I can't be bothered. Does that make sense? Yeah? So what you're trying to do in your marketing is with integrity, build relationship with people so that you can make your offer to them. So benefit from your offer, yeah? So you can only sell through relationships. It's, way, it's very difficult to someone like just knocking on your door and selling you door to door. Very difficult job to do that, yeah? Um, whereas like, you know, friend recommendations are a really big thing. That's where you see a lot of what's called social proof on websites, which is pictures of people, preferably famous people, if not the people that look like the customer, saying, I bought this, it was good. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ah, it's also why when I'm out with my sister, it's much, much easier to chat with girls, but that's another story. It's like, I'm pre-approved, social proof. <laughs> so, same principle of work, but not for this audience. Um, so, that's what we're trying to do, right? Build relationships. Nothing wrong with that, is there? Nothing wrong with trying to build relationships with people. Nothing wrong with getting to know people. And remember, if you're integrous in this, you're genuinely looking for people whose needs that you can meet. So if I meet someone who's a yoga teacher who's completely hippy-dippy, I'm like, well, that's not really my target market and they're probably not going to be very happy as my customer. And they might, I can take their money, but then they come to the workshop, they wouldn't enjoy it, they tell everyone I was shit, they'd be a pain in the ass, and they probably want half the money back. So I don't want that customer. So actually being discerning about customers is part of the deal here. Does that make sense? So think of this as a sort of romance where you're getting to know, in this case, multiple people, so it's not a monogamous romance. It's a romantic endeavor where you're getting to know people at increasing levels of trust and intimacy, but you're also being discerning along the way. You're saying, well, actually, this person's crazy. I don't want to work with them. You know, this, this person is um, just not going to benefit from what I sell. Or, you know, Jude and I have a very different style. So even if we're selling the same thing, there's people that are going to really like my sort of like yang, kind of wah, that fucking straight to the point style. And she's much more sort of open and soft. And yeah, people are going to like her style better. So even if we had the same product, we'd still have a slightly different target market. Is this all making some kind of sense? Yes. Yeah? So how do we do that? Well, there's lots of ways to build relationship. It could be in person. Um, it could be through recommendations, referrals, and you can actually improve those. So for example, when I do a yoga teacher training, I'll say to all the people that did last year that I thought really benefited from it, which hopefully was much of them, please tell two friends this week that this training is on and what you got from it. So I'm quite specific with the request that I make to them, and that helps them refer. Now, if, if I, they got a lot of value from it, they're going to be like, well, of course, no problem. They're going to be delighted to do that, you know? So it's not like hassling people to do that, you know? Um, it could be networking events. It could be, you know, there's the, the cold knocking on the doors, but then you may have to have some meetings to get to know people. Just making sense. So, cool. Question, that's the basics. So cut that, because I want to take some questions. Question